Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Eric Green, Director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, and I want to welcome all of you to uh, the one and only annual lectureship we host at NHGRI each year, and that's the Jeffrey Trent Lecture in Cancer Research. Um, I'm going to just briefly tell you about the history of this lectureship, and then I'm going to turn this over to Dan Castro, who'll introduce today's speaker. Um, the internal program of NHGRI was uh, founded in 1993 when Francis Collins arrived on the scene to be uh, the director of the institute. But upon arriving here, what Francis did was to create an intramural research program at the institute, which previously did not exist. And he recruited Jeff Trent, a colleague of his from University of Michigan, to come here and to be the first scientific director, in other words, the director of the intramural program at NHGRI. Um, in turn, uh, Jeff uh, recruited a number of people, including myself, to the intramural program. and. Um, and the rest is sort of history. Uh, Jeff was responsible literally for building the program um, from essentially a non-existent um, um, a program, uh, recruiting a number of individuals and ably leading the program for the better part of nine years, um, and uh, really taking it from just complete sort of conception of an idea of having an intramural program dedicated to genomics to actually have it being a thriving intramural program that I think has greatly influenced um, this entire campus uh, through the expertise it's been able to provide in genomics and its application to study of human disease and eventually clinical medicine. So when Jeff uh, departed um, in uh, 2002, uh, I was appointed the scientific director at that time, and one of the first things I did was to uh, start a lecture series that would honor Jeff and to, as much as anything else, just thank him for everything he had done. And so we created uh, the Jeffrey Trent Lectureship. And, and we focused it on cancer research. And, um, and since that time, there has been just a remarkable uh, set of lecturers who have come and given uh, that lecture. Um, and uh, it's been just wonderful to see a number of people just sort of come through and give talks um, really at the interface of cancer and genomics, uh, something that uh, Jeff was and continues to be passionate about and a real expert in. And it's sort of his legacy in terms of providing leadership to our entrepreneurial program very much um, is reflected by the type of people we're consistently able to attract uh, to give this annual event. So with that as a historic background, I'm going to introduce you to the third uh, scientific director of NHGRI, and that's Dan Kastner, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you for coming. Well, thanks very much, Eric. Um, and it's my enormous honor and pleasure uh, this afternoon to introduce to you Dr. Catherine Janeway. Uh, Dr. Janeway is uh, currently a senior attending physician at uh, Boston Children's Hospital in the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, Dr. Janeway did her undergraduate work at Barnard uh, in New York, but then went on to Boston, uh, where she has been ever since. And uh, she did her medical school uh, training at Harvard Medical School and also got a uh, master's in medical science uh, there at, at uh, Harvard Medical School as well. Uh, she did a pediatrics uh, residency at Boston Children's Hospital uh, in the Dana-Farber uh, and went on to become uh, the chief resident in pediatrics and then uh, did her uh, fellowship in uh, uh, hematology oncology at uh, Boston Children's and uh, Dana-Farber and went on uh, to join the staff there at Boston Children's and Dana-Farber. And she has become an absolute leader uh, in the application of genomics uh, to uh, pediatric hematology oncology. And uh, during the course of uh, the 10 years that she has been uh, on the staff uh, at Boston Children's and Dana-Farber, uh, she has become the uh, program director uh, for solid tumors uh, at uh, those institutions. Uh, she's become a real leader in Ewing sarcoma uh, and osteosarcoma. Uh, she's the chair, co-chair of uh, a number of different uh, national uh, consortia and uh, uh, collaborative studies uh, looking at uh, ways of improving the treatment of those diseases. And she's really been someone who has uh, taken the lead in terms of applying genomics uh, to these very important uh, problems uh, in uh, pediatrics. So without further ado, uh, I will give you uh, Dr. Jane Way, the title of whose talk will be Bringing Genomics to the Pediatric Oncology Clinic, Diagnosis, Treatment Selection, and Rational Clinical Trial Design. Catherine. 
take it away. <laughs> well, thanks very much um, for the introduction and um, for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here to speak with you today. Um, so just to give you a sense of what I'll uh, discuss today, um, I'll first start um, by giving you um, a brief um, background just to sort of orient you to my perspective on precision cancer medicine in the pediatric oncology space. Um, and then um, I'll um, try to uh, sort of concisely wrap up what we've learned from the clinical sequencing studies that have been conducted to date in pediatric oncology and how they inform uh, precision trials. Um, and then I'd like to give you a sense of where we are in pediatric oncology in terms of precision cancer trials. Um, and I'll touch on a couple of different approaches to that. One is um, to discuss basket trials in relapse disease using the example of the pediatric match. And then I'll touch on two alternative uh, precision trial designs. And then finally, I'll end the talk um, with a brief discussion of um, what's going on in the data aggregation or big data analytics space um, in pediatric oncology. So I think I don't need to just um, really convince this audience of the importance um, or significance of precision cancer medicine. Um, but I, I pulled a couple of recent examples um, just to kind of bring it to the front of your mind. Um, and the first um, on the left here is a very recent publication in the New England Journal of Medicine um, demonstrating that in women who have germline BRCA mutations, who have newly diagnosed metastatic breast cancer, who are randomized to receive either olaparib, which is a targeted therapy in this um, disease, or standard therapy, there's a significant improvement in progression-free survival. Um, and olaparib is a drug that has been studied in the sort of relapsed and refractory setting for um, quite a long period of time in the um, BRCA deficient um, cancers. And it's really, um, I, I gave this example primarily because it's nice to see um, um, this work moving into the, the upfront uh, treatment setting. And then the second is a very well, this very well known example of um, really unbelievably dramatic and frequent responses to PD-1 blockade in mismatch repair, repair deficient cancers leading to the first FDA approval of a drug for um, a genomic biomarker. And um, it's really um, gratifying to see um, the, the sort of beginnings of examples of these types of precision cancer medicine successes in pediatric oncology. This is a slide taken from the ASCO um, 2017 annual meeting um, from a presentation of a phase one trial of larotrectinib, which is a TREC inhibitor in TREC fusion positive malignancies. Turns out that TREC fusion positive malignancies span the age range. And um, what was incredibly um, significant for those of us in the pediatric oncology community was to see that the phase one trials in adults and pediatric patients were conducted simultaneously and presented together in a, in a very nice um, plenary presentation. Um, and this is just a case example of a dramatic response. And if you look at the timeline, this is the patient at baseline and after four doses of the drug. So it's an incredibly effective um, targeted therapy. And it's really nice to see that our, our pediatric patients did not need to wait to access this clinical trial. Um, so, you know, that just hopefully brings to the forefront of your mind why we're here talking about bringing genomics to the clinic. Um, but now I'll throw a little bit of cold water on that. So, um, you know, this infographic is beautifully simple and very logical. Patient A has mutation A, gets drug A, and has this dramatic response. Um, but I think what we've learned from bringing genomics to the clinic is that the devil really is in the details. It's not that simple, okay? Um, and, um, um, you know, just to begin uh, discussing what I think is an incredibly important issue in this field um, that adds to the complexity is um, somatic variant interpretation. Um, and so when you draw this nice infographic, there are a couple of assumptions that are made, right? One is that mutation A is a well-known or well-characterized mutation, that you know what it's doing to the protein, that you know what that protein is doing in that particular cancer type, that that's sort of undergirded by a huge amount of basic science research, that this line between mutation A and drug A 
is a strong and forceful line, meaning there's a ton of evidence that supports a link between this mutation and activity of drug A. But in fact, we really don't we, we work in a space where um, when we're bringing genomics to the clinic, we often get mutations where we don't, we're uncertain about the type of mutation. This, the line, drawing the line between this mutation and a drug is sometimes difficult. And finally, you have to consider the drug itself. Is it really a targeted therapy, right? Um, there are many drugs that are thought to be, or that are called targeted therapies that may in fact have off-target uh, um, uh, activity. And so um, we really, in this field of precision medicine, have only just now um, begun to approach um, um, the, the, the sort of um, difficulty of characterizing the somatic variants and what they mean for the patients, uh, both in, in the space. So this, I'm showing you now um, a, a publication in Genome Medicine that came from the ClinGen Somatic Variant Working Group. Um, which basically tries to break this down. Um, and so um, the, this is the sort of characterization uh, labels that have been used in the germline space for variants. Um, and really, uh, they've, they've proposed using these characterizations in the somatic space. Um, and if you have a pathogenic mutation, meaning it's likely to alter protein function, that you think about the implications in the diagnostic, prognostic, and predictive, meaning prognostic space, uh, sorry, um, a predictive space. Um, but what's really important in this um, schema, in, an, in several other schemas that recommend, uh, make recommendations about how to do somatic variant interpretation is the evidence piece, okay? So what is that, what do you mean by evidence? So there's evidence about the variant, um, and then there's also evidence about that line connecting the variant to the drug, in that example, um, mutation A to mutation B. Um, and that evidence can be preclinical evidence, it can be a case report, or it can be a randomized clinical trial. Um, and um, the reality is that in the pediatric oncology space and also in uh, other rare cancers, um, we're very often operating in a realm without sufficient evidence. Um, I didn't really talk much about germline variant interpretation. I just want to say there are more better established criteria and terminology for variant classification, but germline variant interpretation still requires time and appropriately trained personnel. Um, and so the whole, uh, both somatic and germline vari variant interpretation can be difficult. Um, and then to add to the complexity of sort of bringing genomics to the clinic um, in pediatric oncology are some aspects of the pediatric cancer genome. So I think all of you know and are familiar um, with this um, diagram uh, from uh, uh, Bert Vogelstein's review in Science, and there are other pictures of this um, that show that the pediatric, the cancers that tend to occur in the pediatric age range have a very low um, number of amino acid changing single nucleotide variants or indels. Um, and so where adult cancers have sort of one to 10 mutations per megabase of DNA, pediatric cancers, even those with a high mutation rate, have about 0.4 to 0.5 mutations per megabase of DNA. And some pediatric tumors have very few mutations, and the best example of that is rhabdoid tumors. Um, however, I would like to point out um, that it may be that other genomic mechanisms that are not detected by whole exome sequencing, which is what most of these types of figures are based on, may in fact be present and may in fact be targetable, okay? So some have interpreted this um, lack of mutations to um, mean that there are more limited opportunities for practicing precision medicine um, in pediatric oncology. Others have said, well, if you find a mutation, it's more likely to be a driver because there's less noise. So in fact, uh, uh, pediatric oncology is the ideal circumstance in which to um, base therapy on um, the, the genomic mutations that you find. Um, in fact, we have taken a slightly different interpretation. Um, and that is really um, demonstrated by this figure, um, which is from one of Mike Lawrence's uh, recent um, pan cancer papers. And that perspective is that um, we know very little about the genomes of most of the cancers that occur in the pediatric patient population. Um, and um, basically what this figure shows is that the ability to detect recurrent mutations at the level of somewhere between 1 and 10 percent, 
when you're doing um, a sort of discovery sequencing study, um, depends on the number of tumor normal pairs sequenced and the baseline somatic mutation frequency. Um, and while pediatric oncology um, has a number of quiet tumors, so the baseline uh, or the background somatic mutation frequency is low, our diseases are incredibly rare. And in fact, um, the only disease in, in pediatric oncology that doesn't meet the NIH definition of a rare disease is leukemia. And the only other disease that's been had a relatively large number of tumor normal pairs sequenced, um, over 1,000, is neuroblastoma. In fact, most of our cancers are like the one shown in this study um, and circled here in red, where the number of tumor normal pairs sequenced to date is too few to say with any confidence that we've ruled out the possibility of a recurrent somatic mutation present at the, at the frequency of 5 to 10 percent. Um, in addition, we have sequenced very few um, tumors from relapsed or refractory disease. Um, and uh, so really, this is the simplistic way of saying that. What we know about the pediatric cancer genome is really the tip of the iceberg. And I promise that at the end of the talk, I will um, come back to um, um, sort of how uh, additional sequencing efforts, uh, discovery sequencing efforts like the Target Project and the Pediatric Cancer Genome Project led by St. Jude are uh, hopefully going to help us um, um, uh, move beyond this. But because um, we understand so little about the pediatric cancer genome, the key question that we really wrestled with um, uh, and continue to wrestle with is, is it possible to extend the successes of precision medicine to pediatric patients with cancers where the key gene variants are not yet known? And at the time that we started wrestling with this question, we were, I was fortunate to be um, at the Dana-Farber and Boston Children's where um, an institute-wide project called Profile had been launched. This is an enterprise-level research project between three hospitals, Dana-Farber, Cancer Institute, Boston Children's, and Brigham and Women's, and it started in 2012. And essentially, all children with cancer or suspected cancer seen at Boston Children's or Dana-Farber are offered the opportunity to participate. And participation allows use of clinically acquired leftover specimens for research sequencing, uh, for research, which includes sequencing. Um, uh, we have done a pilot um, study in solid tumors where we have actually allocated some samples for creation of patient-derived models, including cell lines and PDXs. Um, you can ask me questions about that at the end. I won't touch on that more in this talk. Um, it allows us to collect blood, cheek swabs, and urine for research to use specimens and derivatives and place them in a tumor bank, um, which is a virtual tumor bank, so you can actually select the actual physical tumor bank. And then the genomic data can be linked to clinical data for research purposes. Patients who have, within this project or this study, patients who have greater than 10 FFP unstained slides with 20% viable tumor um, uh, have a sample submitted for tumor-only sequencing performed in a clinical lab and results with potential clinical impact for, uh, with potential to impact clinical care or return to the primary oncologist and the patient. Um, I will come back later to sort of where we are with this study, um, but when this study started, we sort of looked around and thought to ourselves, if we do this um, at the Dana-Farber only, we will never learn anything, or at least it will be a long time until we learn anything. Um, from this project, and I'm very impatient. Um, and so uh, we actually um, launched a multi-institution study that's based loosely on the profile study. Um, the, the sequencing test that is performed within profile and in the multi-institution study I'll tell you about is called Oncopanel. Um, the sequencing success rate is very high. It's 96%. We use um, FFPE as our sort of starting material. Um, the results are concordant with gold standard assays, and it's both sensitive and precise. And it's performed in the Center for Advanced Molecular Diagnostics um, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, there have been three versions of the Oncopanel test. I'm showing you the 450 genes included in the most recent version. These, the top genes are sequenced for coding um, region changes, um, and the, uh, there are 60 genes where uh, we capture across the introns um, so that um, uh, we can um, identify um, uh, translocation events. Um, the report generated from the Center for Advanced Molecular Diagnostics includes um, a diagram of the copy number alterations. Um, the variants are tiered based on um, sort of loosely uh, uh, defined criteria of clinical actionability. 
Um, and um, because this is tumor-only sequencing, I just want to point out that if, particularly if a patient is of a non-Caucasian ethnic background, um, there will be um, a large number of tier four variants, which are uh, primarily rare germline polymorphisms. <clears throat> and then uh, there can be uh, interpretation uh, provided for, for the variants, and the extent of interpretation is variable depending on who's signing out the report. So as I mentioned, um, we decided um, that we would actually like in pediatric oncology to um, conduct this project as a multi-institution um, study, and this is actually the first multi-institution precision cancer medicine study in pediatric oncology, and we called it the Individualized Cancer Therapy, or ICAT-1 study. And our goal was to determine whether it was feasible to identify key gene variants and make what we called individual, individualized cancer therapy or ICAT recommendations using the clinical sequencing tests that were available to us at the time. Um, patients were eligible if they had high-risk extracranial solid tumors, and we allowed patients to enroll up to age 30. The tumor samples used for sequencing uh, were, uh, as I mentioned, sort of clinically acquired, meaning they were sitting in the pathology department, which most often means that they are paraffin embedded samples. We um, accepted samples from diagnosis relapse and preferred to have paired samples if possible. Tumor was subjected to um, a mutation detection, was performed using the Oncopanel test, um, and I forgot to mention it's a target capture followed by um, uh, you know, next generation sequencing using Illumina. Um, we did uh, perform a ray CGH when there was sufficient tumor material for additional assessment of copy number changes, um, and then occasionally would do um, sort of follow up tests if that was recommended by the expert panel. We had an expert panel or a molecular oncology tumor board that reviewed the results for um, clinical significance. Um, we made an ICAT recommendation if there was a, um, a variant present that we thought was likely to alter protein function. Um, other people have called that pathogenic. We prefer to use the term altering protein function. Um, that we thought was uh, that there was sufficient evidence um, to support that it might actually be involved with cancer-related behavior. Um, we needed to have, we, we sort of tiered the ICAT recommendation depending on what evidence linked that variant to response to targeted therapy. And we only made an ICAT recommendation if targeted therapy was actually available, meaning that there was a dose and formulation that was appropriate for that patient. Our tiering system um, was, um, we used tiers one and two. If there was clinical evidence supporting the link between the variant and response to targeted therapy, tiers three and four if it was preclinical evidence, and tier five if we just thought it was a good idea because you always need that basket for consensus opinion. Um, we issued what we called an ICAT report and sent that back to the patient uh, via their oncologist. So in terms of results, um, the first result uh, that was really notable um, and was not known at the time was that there was a high degree of physician and patient engagement in a study like this. So um, that uh, graph up here is our, the blue is our projected accrual and the red is our actual accrual. Um, the second was um, that we actually could do this as a multi-institution effort in that 40% of the enrolled patients came from our three collaborating institutions. And the first sort of take-home message um, was that 30% um, of the patients participating got what we called an ICAT recommendation. Um, and this has been published for some time now, and you can look up uh, what those recommendations were based on. But loosely, it was um, uh, uh, actual um, uh, single nucleotide variants or indels, um, copy number alterations, um, and then uh, uh, various rearrangement events. Um, an additional 10% of patients had results that had implications for patient care, and I'll go into that um, more in the next two slides. And then we had um, someone from our population sciences department working with us who conducted surveys of the participants in this study. And over 90% of the participants recognized that they were doing, participating in this study to further our knowledge of cancer care, which is how we explain the study to them. And more than 90% said they would participate again. Um, okay, so going into that additional 10% who had results um, with implications for patient care. Um, the, the first, uh, we found that 10% of the patients on tumor-only sequencing had a somatic result that 
suggested the presence of a germline cancer predisposition syndrome, but we did not do germline sequencing. So it's actually better to turn to um, Will Parsons' study, which was one of the CSER-funded projects um, called BASIC-3, where he actually enrolled um, a very similar patient population in that they had um, solid tumors, um, so no hematologic malignancies, but he enrolled patients at, at initial diagnosis. And they did clinical sequencing um, using whole exome sequencing of uh, tumor and germline. And in his study, um, he identified 10% uh, of patients had true inherited uh, cancer mutations. Um, uh, those are the sort of known pathogenic mutations. Um, and um, this has been shown in, in subsequent studies as well. And so an important lesson um, from these initial set of studies is that germline cancer predisposition is much more common in pediatric oncology than we previously appreciated. Um, so there were a few other patients who had um, interesting results um, that, that had implications for Karen, and, and this um, slide really um, highlights uh, that group of patients. We did a pilot study where we um, selected nine uh, cases for RNA sequencing, and we based that selection on um, patients having undifferentiated sarcomas or translocation-associated sarcomas where the translocation was not identified with standard testing. Um, in two of the patients, the expected translocation was identified, so that helped us to clarify diagnosis. And in three patients, translocations were identified that had either potential therapeutic or diagnostic implications. Um, for example, um, a patient who had, was thought to have had Ewing sarcoma actually had a variant EWSR1 translocation that is associated with other diagnoses. Um, we had a patient who was diagnosed with melanoma who, in fact, had an EWSR1 ATF1 mutation, which is much more consistent with a diagnosis of cutaneous clear cell sarcoma. And then a patient with inter with, who was called intermediate-grade spindle cell sarcoma who, who, because they had an ETV6 fish, a break-apart fish that was negative, um, and this is the test that is typically done for infantile fibrosarcoma, in fact, they had an NTREC3 fusion. It was just a fusion with a different fusion partner, EML4. And so um, in reality, having an NTREC3 fusion with an intermediate-grade spindle cell sarcoma is infantile fibrosarcoma. It's just that the standard test was unable to detect this novel fusion. Um, and so um, the lesson uh, here um, is really twofold. One is... Um, some of the genomic sequencing results, you know, we sort of got into this because we were interested in precision therapies, but in fact, um, we're starting to learn that genomics can help us with precision diagnosis. Um, but in addition, um, we, while some of these fusions could be, be detected by our current um, panel test, um, some additional fusions that we found um, are unable to be detected that way. And so... Um, the use of RNA sequencing in this way really highlighted the fact that it's really not yet known which tumor profiling assays optimally balance the competing factors of minimal tissue requirement, comprehensive genomic assessment, and rapid data analysis and results reporting. Um, so, um, and then finally, um, you know, everyone's interested to know in our study, how did the patients do, right, who got match therapy, right? You had 30% of your patients who had um, um, uh, an ICAT recommendation. Well, it turns out that um, we had a relatively short follow-up time of only six months, um, and only three of the 31 patients who got ICAT recommendations actually got targeted therapy matched to the ICAT recommendation. We did a little physician survey, which, of course, had a low response rate, asking why or why not did you give matched targeted therapy. Um, in some cases, the expert panel um, had reviewed the case, and, you know, theoretically a clinical trial was available, but in reality for the patient, that clinical trial wasn't available. We didn't have access to sort of all the criteria for eligibility uh, for that particular patient. Um, in other cases, the clinical status was not what it needed to be in order for the patient to get therapy. In some cases, the patient was in second remission with standard relapse therapy, and in some cases, the disease was too advanced or the patient was deceased. Similar results were found in um, uh, another clinical sequencing study that came out just before ours, 
Um, this was another NHGRI CSER funded study conducted at the University of Michigan in which patients with all diagnoses were, uh, had clinical sequencing done uh, using whole exome sequencing uh, uh, tumor normal uh, pairs. Um, in, his, in this case as well, a very small proportion of patients got match targeted therapy. And I think really we've learned in this field that this magic sweet spot that's required to receive match targeted therapy where the gene variant is identified the patient has an appropriate clinical status and the drug is available is relatively rare and it's hard to make this happen. And so um, we, have, we think that um, future studies in this space need to assess reasons for failure to receive match targeted therapy and really importantly in pediatric oncology particularly, we need more trials of targeted therapy where there are biomarker criteria for trial entry. Oh, by the way, None of the three patients responded. We can talk about that more later if you want to ask me questions about that. Um, so um, I've told you about sort of the first three clinical sequencing studies that were um, published in pediatric oncology. They all have very consistent results, the sort of 30% rate of potentially targetable or potentially actionable variants, germline uh, cancer risk and this sense that there's probably more uh, in the genome than what you can find by just looking for SMVs and indels. Um, there are additional um, clinical sequencing studies that have been published since then, and I just give you a list of those here. Um, but again, the findings are very similar. But we still have unanswered question. Um, the first is, um, our, um, uh, I should just emphasize here that the majority of these studies um, have primarily patients with either intracranial or extracranial solid tumors. And the leukemias, uh, the feasibility of doing clinical sequencing, returning results, and looking for sort of match targeted therapy has been much not as well studied in the hematologic malignancies. Um, that's, there, I think there are a number of reasons for that. Um, some of it has to do with the pace of disease in, hemat in relapsed hematologic malignancy. Some of it has to do with the possibility of bone marrow transplant for those patients. Um, but I actually just want to point out that um, uh, Mignon Lo and Kim Stegmeier at UCSF and Dana Farber um, have collaborate and with, collaborated with a number of other institutions um, to do sort of a very similar feasibility study that's focused on high risk leukemias and relapsed leukemias. And there's the clinical trial identifier for that. Um, the, the second unanswered question is, what is the actual impact of receiving much targeted therapy on outcome? So none of the sort of feasibility studies really answer that question. Um, they don't even, we didn't even propose to try to look at that question in our ICAT-1 study. The third, I already mentioned what sequencing approach is really the optimal approach. And um, finally, I think we really don't yet understand the full spectrum of actionable uh, variants that we see in our diseases. So, um, um, but what all of those clinical sequencing studies do is to provide us with enough evidence to say, yeah, we can do precision trials in pediatric oncology. We think that's a good idea. So um, I'll spend the next 20 minutes or so telling you um, about the precision trials um, that are ongoing in pediatric oncology. And um, uh, I'm gonna highlight um, three examples. Um, and I'll start with, um, basket trials, and recurrent disease. Um, and um, I'll start with uh, the NCI Children's Oncology Group Pediatric Match. Um, and the first thing I like to say when I get to this slide, um, it's very important to point out, I am not one of the co-chairs of this study. So if you don't like anything about it, it's not my fault, OK? <laughs> Um, I am uh, highly involved. I'm the vice chair of the screening protocol, and I'm, um, I, was, uh, very, I am very involved in selecting uh, study agents. Um, so, um, you know, basket studies are basically trial. There's, okay, the term has been used loosely, so um, I'll explain this basket trial. <laughs> um, but basically, the idea is patients enter, and in this case, it's a, it's a relapse refractory trial, and it's um, children are eligible if they have relapse refractory solid tumors or lymphomas, and that includes histiocytoses, which is important because those have activating mutations in the RAF um, uh, MAP kinase pathway. Um, uh, there needs to be some sort of tumor material um, that can be subjected to sequencing, um, and in this case, um, the tumor material that's required needs to be from a relapse or refractory disease state. It cannot be the newly diagnosed. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. 
Um, the tumor is subjected to genetic sequencing, and the way that this trial is designed is everything up until here, where this little box drops down, which is actually a targeted therapy trial arm, is part of what's called the screening protocol. So a patient enrolls actually on the screening protocol. Um, we collect the tissue, we do the sequencing, we um, figure out whether or not there's an actionable mutation detected, and then we make a match to a clinical trial arm if one of the predetermined or pre-selected mutations is present. So um, then there's a cassette of trial arms. Um, and for each trial arm of a targeted therapy, um, the uh, variants that um, would be allow, allow a patient to get onto the trial are predetermined. Okay, So this matching is done in a sort of automated fashion although there is human review before the patient is actually um, uh, 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 assigned to that arm of the trial. Then the patient is essentially on a phase two trial. And the primary endpoint of each of those phase two trials is an objective response rate. Um, importantly, um, some of the trial arms actually allow for enrollment of biomarker negative patients. And that was done if there was a sense that there were biomarkers, but that we didn't understand the full spectrum of the biomarkers that might predict response um, to a targeted therapy. And I'll show you the example of that when we get to the um, slide that shows what drugs are actually part of this trial. And then one final um, aspect of the design is that for each of these phase two trials of a, of a study agent, um, if there is some signal of activity, um, in a particular histology, so if I think it's three patients with a particular histology or on, this, on that arm, and there is a signal of activity, you can actually expand the trial for that particular histology so that you get a full phase two trial where the, the patients have a, uh, a set of variants that predict response plus a specific histology. So um, some... Uh, um, more sort of detail about this, these specifics. In terms of specimen requirements, um, this trial actually allows for biopsy to be performed for study purposes if the biopsy is low risk. Um, and there's a whole description in the protocol of what that means, and there's a good deal of evidence to suggest that complication rates from these low risk biopsies are very low in our patients and are not outside the realm of the risks that our patients face in everyday care. Um, in terms of secondary objectives, I just want to highlight a few. Um, one of them is that we do have a cell-free DNA um, uh, objective. And what we're really looking at here is the ability to use cell-free DNA to detect the genetic alterations that are present at the time a patient enrolls, and then to um, use cell-free DNA to look for mechanisms of resistance. Um, and so there are three time points when cell-free DNA is collected. Um, we are interested in the um, uh, patients will have germline uh, mutation testing performed and it will be returned. Um, and that's because of the importance of uh, germline mutation uh, in these uh, cancers. And then finally, I just want to mention that the MATCH assay, which many of you may be familiar with, um, is uh, uh, using an ion torrent um, or hot, um, amplicon uh, uh, technology. And as I, I already mentioned, the reporting, which is sort of this automated reporting. The results that get returned um, will either tell you that you match to a, your patient matches to a trial arm, and then here are some other variants that were found with minimal clinical interpretation of those additional variants. Um, so I am co-chair of what's called the Target and Agent Prioritization Committee with Jay Cho. Um, our charge was to prioritize the most relevant molecular targets and corresponding agents to recommend to the trial leadership for consideration of inclusion as sort of trial arms. Um, the members of this committee uh, represent the Children's Oncology Group Disease Committees, the NCI, CTAP, um, and um, uh, NCI match, which is we call adult match, so match trial, but in, being done in adult patients, and the FDA. Um, basically, we went about this um, in a very, uh, sort of like you would a grant review. We did a detailed assessment of all the target agent pairs that could be considered, and we assigned those target agent pairs to reviewers who looked at all the literature. Um, we asked them to consider the following factors. How common is the target, target in the eligible patient population? What level of evidence is there linking that target to the agent activity or that mutation to the agent activity? 
And at minimum, we required that there had to be at least some kind of clinical level of evidence. Okay, so our minimum clinical level of evidence is a case report in a patient who has a variant in the target gene that's expected to alter protein function, who has a response. But with that, because you can get that randomly, right? So occasionally patients respond to phase one trials. You also have to have really good preclinical data that demonstrates the mechanism or the, the sort of underlying biology that links a variant in that gene to response to that class of agents. Um, as I mentioned, we sort of had this grant style review. We discussed, we voted, um, and then we had co-chair review. We assessed the suitability of the match assay to identify the variants in the target gene uh, or set of genes. Um, and also we looked at the impact of the trial design on priorities. So this, importantly, this mostly came up with the um, CDK4-6 inhibitors, which are thought to be more cytostatic, uh, cytostatic than cytotoxic. And when you have an objective response rate as your primary endpoint, you sort of have to think about whether or not you're gonna expect objective response rate. Um, and then um, we made recommendations to the match leadership who then there's a sort of follow-up process where you engage industry to actually select the agent from that class of agents. So these are the initial um, arms of the NCI COG pediatric match um, protocol. Um, and we're showing you um, the, the agent class and the actual agent that's included in the trial. And the example that I mentioned that allows biomarker negative patients are the PI3 kinase mTOR inhibitors um, because there are sort of signals that there might be uh, predictive biomarkers. Um, but on the other hand, um, there are certainly patients who respond to this class of agents without necessarily having a predictive biomarker. So, um, so that, you know, basket trial, like the NCI COG match trial, is sort of um, the way what people typically think about. Um, when um, they are thinking about sort of precision trial designs. However, um, in medical oncology, um, there's been exploration of a lot of other precision medicine trial designs. Um, and um, I'm gonna highlight two um, that are ongoing in pediatric oncology. The first is sort of a real world evidence um, type of design, and the second is a pragmatic trial. Um, and the two of them are, are sort of related to each other. Um, the first one is, um, our follow-up to the ICAT-1 uh, study, um, and the second is the um, uh, American um, Society of Clinical Oncology, what's called TAPER trial. So um, <clears throat> after finishing our feasibility study, the ICAT-1 study really was meant to be a feasibility study. Um, as I mentioned, we felt that there were a number of um, questions remaining to be answered, um, and uh, a number of Investigators at other institutions fortunately agreed with us, um, and we formed um, a 12-member consortium called the Genomic Assessment Informs Novel Therapy, or GAIN Consortium. And our first um, clinical sequencing cohort study is actively enrolling patients, and it's called the GAIN Consortium ICAT-2 study. Um, the title is too long to read, so I'll just tell you about it. <laughs> um, patients are focused on the same patient population as uh, we focused on in ICAT-1. Um, patients have extracranial solid tumors that are either high risk uh, for relapse um, due to their initial presenting features, recurrent, um, or we've actually um, broadened our eligibility just a little bit for this trial to specifically um, target patients who have an unclear diagnosis after standard histopathology review and molecular testing. And the reason we actually called out these patients in our eligibility criteria is we realized they actually fit into this high-risk group. We actually don't know their prognosis. Um, so it's hard for the investigator who's seeing that patient to say they're eligible based on, we, by the way, we define this newly diagnosed high-risk as um, expected overall survival of, um, uh, sorry, two-year event-free survival of 50% or less so that we would include high-risk neuroblastoma. Um, these patients who have an unclear diagnosis, there's no way for the investigator or the, or the clinician to actually decide what their prognosis is. Um, but we all have a sense that their prognosis probably isn't great, right? If we don't know what they have, we don't know how to treat them, and treatment uh, is the number one prognostic factor. So um, we uh, specifically allow those patients to enroll. In terms of tumor profiling, we continue to perform primarily um, Oncopanel as our targeted next-generation pa sequencing panel test. It says here tumor plus normal, 
Um, we are still doing tumor-only sequencing um, because um, the Center for Advanced Molecular Diagnostics timeline for initiating normal oncopanel testing has been longer than we anticipated, but we actually have all of our normal samples banked and plan to send them for testing as soon as they're able to do that, which they promised me will be quite soon. Um, and then we actually have a very complex um, diagram where we then select patients for either whole exome sequencing and or RNA sequencing, um, depending on uh, what the diagnosis is. And just I would summarize that to say we tend to send rare tumor types for whole exome sequencing because we think there's still discovery potential to that approach. And we tend to send patients where we think there might be fusions for RNA sequencing. Um, and certainly all of the patients with an unclear diagnosis uh, have their tumor sent for RNA sequencing. Um, the uh, targeted panel and the whole exome sequencing are done in a clinical lab. The RNA sequencing right now is um, done uh, as research. Um, both of the whole exome and RNA-seq are done uh, with the, in collaboration with the Broad Institute. Um, and we're hoping RNA sequencing will transition to a clinical lab, uh, to the clinical side of the Broad Institute before too long. Um, one thing that's sort of changed over time um, in this protocol is uh, that more and more of our consortium partners have their own clinical testing labs now that are doing targeted panel testing, or they've um, developed a, a relationship with a commercial lab. And so um, we have, uh, after much discussion, decided that we never want to repeat a targeted next-gen sequencing panel test with a similar, with a test that covers essentially the same set of genes, which many of these tests do. Um, and so we actually have modified the protocol so that rather than accepting a sample for testing, we can accept a report and data. Um, so, um, so that we don't actually waste tissue on repeating something that's already been done. Um, a very important part of our project is um, the um, variant curation that I touched on in the beginning of the talk. What is this variant? What is it doing to the protein? Uh, what do we think its role is in cancer? And then the, what we call the clinical interpretation, which is determining what sort of clinical significance that variant has for that patient. Um, and we make an ICAT recommendation very similar to what we did before, continuing with our sort of um, tiering of the evidence. Um, and then what's different in this study is we do quite a bit of follow-up data collection of the patient's vital status, treatment, and treatment responses. Um, we do have uh, a cell-free DNA aspect of this project as well. We're assessing barriers to receiving match-targeted therapy. Um, we are um, planning to hopefully integrate this project into the project, the, the collaboration we have with the Broad, uh, where we're trying to create um, patient-derived um, cell lines. Um, I was mentioning to a couple of people that, um, to be honest, my least favorite part of this project is the, the piece, the informatics uh, infrastructure that's needed to support a project like this. So when you're collecting samples from 11 different institutions, you're doing testing and you have to return test results, you have to make sure you don't lose things and you have to make sure you know how long you've had something so that you know, people are waiting. So we learned with our first project that you really need good informatics support for that and that there aren't really products out there that you can just, that are off the shelf products that can do this. Um, and so um, we've worked with the University of Chicago, um, which is one of our collaborating centers somewhere here. Here it is. Um, and they have a pediatric oncologist who runs an IT group um, to develop what we call our gain cast and sample tracking or gain cast system, um, which allows us to track everything and, and return results. Um, and um, uh, even more importantly, um, we've worked with them to develop a knowledge base, which is also what we use to um, um, create our clinical interpretation reports, which we call gain reports. Um, and the idea here is really to um, decrease the burden of that somatic variant interpretation by being sure that we're um, uh, holding our knowledge and making it easily accessible so we can re-access um, knowledge about variants and about um, the, their clinical meaning in our diseases. Um, there are a number of knowledge bases out there. Um, My Cancer Genome is an example. It's probably the first one that, that, was, uh, that existed but we don't find them to be that helpful for our cancer types. They tend to focus on um, um, you know, uh, 
phase two and three clinical trial evidence and sort of FDA-indicated therapies, and we tend to operate mostly in the preclinical realm. So uh, we tend to find that we need our own uh, knowledge base. So our study um, activated in November of 2015. Um, we were active for about a year with only the Dana-Farber um, as a site. Um, then we had a second site that activated, and finally, once we got all the lawyers, you know, actually working on our project, we were able to activate um, all but the um, final remaining site, and we're now accruing at the rate that we uh, expected to accrue patients. We have um, 200 patients enrolled. Um, this gets me back to the point I made in the very beginning. Um, pediatric cancers are a collection of rare diseases. So these are um, our enrolled patients broken down by diagnosis. And um, you will see that osteosarcoma is the most common diagnosis, but our second most common diagnosis is rare. This is a collection of single uh, cases of various uh, cancer types. Um, and you'll see that not far down is non rhabdo soft tissue sarcoma, which isn't actually a single diagnosis. It's a collection of rare diagnoses. Um, we've completed 137 uh, onco panels, 24 um, and 23 whole exome and RNA sequencing, um, and then we validated two of our RNA sequencing results, and we have about 59 uh, cell-free DNA samples collected. Um, this is the obligatory um, uh, slide of the single case, um, which I won't dwell on, but just to say we've seen some dramatic responses. This is a novel BRAF fusion uh, patient who received a MEK inhibitor, and this was seen in a neuroendocrine carcinoma, again, a rare tumor. Um, so how are we going to analyze this study? What is our primary objective? Um, well, um, we, are, uh, we have a descriptive primary objective. We are going to describe um, progression-free survival and uh, overall survival is really where we're going to focus, um, comparing patients who received not matched and matched therapy. This is very similar to what was done by the MD Anderson Phase I program. It's not definitive proof that, that precision medicine works. Um, it's really a way to sort of start to explore um, uh, whether or not this approach uh, uh, makes sense. And we think that doing this, doing, practicing, we also can learn, we have a very long list of secondary objectives where we can learn, um, 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 sort of derive key lessons that can really inform um, future um, either basket trials or other types of precision trial designs. Um, so to answer this question, uh, some of our patients need to receive matched therapy. <laughs> and you'll remember that on the first study, only 10%, like three out of 30 patients received matched targeted therapy. So we're really interested in approaches to sort of improving access. And that's where this um, American Society of Clinical Oncology TAPER, or Targeted Agent and Profiling Utilization Registry study comes in. This trial was started um, to address the problems of patients with advanced cancer having no standard treatment options, having had a genomic profiling test performed, having a potentially actionable alteration detected, and having an FDA-approved drug that was available, but finding it difficult to get that drug and also losing the opportunity to learn if they did actually get access to that drug. Um, so I'll go through these taper slides quite quickly, but basically um, this study starts with somebody already having had molecular profiling done, um, deciding to participate in the study. If there is a predetermined match to one of the taper arms, the patient just goes on that arm. If not, there is a molecular tumor board mechanism where the profiling result can be reviewed. Um, and then um, the pharmaceutical company actually provides the study drug at no cost to the patient. Um, and then the patient is followed for toxicity and outcome. Um, there are two sets of eligibility criteria, one for the general protocol and then drug-specific eligibility criteria. But important to note that patients who are 12 and older are eligible. Um, and that was a sort of policy decision on ASCO's part. Um, and patients are eligible if they had solid tumors or um, B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, and the primary objective here is to de describe anti-tumor activity and toxicity of uh, commercially available targeted anti-cancer drugs in patients whose tumors have a genomic variant known to be a drug target or thought to predict sensitivity to a drug. And the primary endpoint is objective response rate or stable disease at 16 weeks. Um, and um, the sort of statistical analysis plan is to enroll 10 patients per group. And the groups are determined by tumor type, variant, and drug. Uh, 
Um, interestingly, they're experiencing a very similar, very lar long tail of rare diagnoses that we are. And so there's probably going to be some modifications to this plan to do um, type variant drug. Um, they're probably going to have to lump some of the tumor types together. Um, the drugs will look very familiar to you. There are only so many tar truly targeted therapies in the world, and so many of these precision trials are using overlapping drugs. Um, and then, um, so that really concludes the, the sort of precision trials that I was going to go into in detail, but I wanted to point out that there are many ways to conduct research in precision oncology. Um, and so... Um, um, there are other basket trials in relapse disease. There are disease-specific basket trials. Um, there are precision trials in newly diagnosed, in newly diagnosed parent patients, which are primarily um, in pediatric oncology being conducted in leukemia. And there are early phase targeted therapy um, trials in biomarker positive patients, like that larotrectinib trial I showed you the image from uh, in the very beginning of the talk. Um, and then we spoke about these uh, in detail. Um, so in the last um, two minutes, I just want to put a plug in for data aggregation and big data. Um, this is not my field, so um, please don't ask me hard questions about this. Um, I really just want to point out that there are several efforts to aggregate pediatric sequencing data. Each of them has their own kind of... Um, um, uh, their own approach and their own uh, kind of um, sweet spot. Um, so there's the Genomic Data Commons, which is a, an NIH-funded effort, um, which is really focused on um, the target data set, which is the sort of uh, TCGA of, of pediatric cancers. And they are accessing primarily data from our cooperative group trials and are really working on um, standardization of clinical data elements. St. Jude pulls any pediatric data that gets put anywhere <laughs> um, into what they, uh, something that they call PCAN, which stands for pediatric cancer. Um, their ability to um, achieve clinical annotation is a little bit less because they're, um, but they have incredible computational biology um, sort of acumen in the pediatric oncology space. Genie, which is the one that I'm most involved with, is a project um, that's funded by AACR that's really trying to get clinical sequencing labs that are in hospitals to deposit data and aggregate data. Um, it tends to be focused on targeted gene panels. The, the, the sort of sweet spot here is that there's incredible potential for clinical annotation because the, the data lives in a hospital space where we have the entire medical record to pull from. Now, how you exactly pull meaningful clinical data from the medical record uh, and annotate it with the genomics is another uh, topic. Um, and then finally, Foundation Medicine um, has um, uh, actually made its pediatric sequencing data um, publicly available. And I'll just show you a case study using some aggregated data. So in the NCI COG match um, trial, I mentioned that we looked for frequent, like we wanted um, uh, variants or targets that were, had frequent alterations. Well, we've sort of mined all of those, and we have arms for all of those. So we're starting to look at what are some of the rare variants that we might see now that we have more sequencing data available to us in these aggregated spaces. And when you look at that, you actually see that there are EGFR mutations in pediatric cancers, and uh, MDM2 amplification. By the way, this is from 981 cases where the diagnosis would make them eligible for the NCI match trial. Um, and the MDM2 amplification is present at about 2%. Um, I'm going back to our profile, our institutional study. We now have 1,200 patients enrolled, and about 650 patients have Oncopanel results available, and we're able to mine those as well. And when you look there, again, you see about 1.5% of patients with MDM2 amplification. And so you can begin to think about whether or not you want to create another arm of the pediatric match trial that has um, the ability for these uh, rarer mutation patients to enroll. Um, so in conclusion, um, I would say uh, that with the current technologies and understanding of genomics and complement of targeted therapies available, many children with cancer still do not be benefit from a precision medicine approach. But when all aspects of the precision oncology paradigm align, clinical impact can be significant for, for individual patients. We have now completed studies demonstrating feasibility, and pediatric precision cancer the, the pediatric precision cancer medicine field is transitioning to evaluating clinical outcome through precision trials. 
And I believe that the number of children with cancer benefiting from a precision oncology approach will increase. We'll need continued sequencing, um, particularly of our rarer diagnoses. That means anything other than leukemia and neuroblastoma. And we'll need to use multiple approaches in that sequencing so we can be sure to detect the variants that are not SMVs and indels. Um, we will need multiple precision trials with various and innovative designs. Um, and we definitely need data sharing and, most importantly, analysis of that data. And so we need more computational biologists who care about pediatric oncology. Um, OK, because this is the Trent lecture, I'm doing an advertisement for Dr. Trent. <laughs> If you um, enjoyed this talk, which I hope you did, uh, you can learn more about pediatric precision cancer medicine um, at a conference uh, Dr. Khan and Dr. Trent are leading, uh, which is going to be in March in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, and it takes a village to do this kind of work. And this is my very long acknowledgment slide with my very nice research team pictured down here on the bottom. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Catherine, for You're that welcome. terrific talk. That was really fantastic. I have uh, just a small token of our appreciation of your giving the Trent Lecture uh, this afternoon uh, for you to take with you. Thank you very much. And maybe I'll start out the questioning, since you wanted to avoid questions on uh, big data and <laughs> aggregation. I'll start there with the interrogation, uh, but maybe a, an easier question. It, it would seem like, you know, using the, the analogy of the um, tip of the iceberg, that there probably are lots and lots of cases out there where sequencing has been done in the United States, but where those data have not yet been incorporated yeah. into this uh, analysis. What do you think the magnitude of that is, and what are the opportunities even internationally uh, to uh, increase the numbers, since it clearly is the case that this is a matter of numbers yeah. uh, to help things along? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, um, it's interesting. I mean, there aren't that many places that are doing the kind of sequencing that is high enough quality that we really want to see it, so or that we want to use it for analysis. Um, so I think that the majority of those places are depositing their data somewhere. Um, the question is, can you get it all in one place, and can you stimulate sort of computational biologists to really work with that data um, and 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 discover? Now, I think that's true in the U.S. internationally is another question. Um, Europe has a very um, cooperative approach to this, and they will have, they have plans for data aggregation, um, where I think that we have not made great efforts, or at least I am not aware of great efforts, is sort of extending beyond Europe. And, and there, I think there's probably potential for, uh, for aggregation. Yeah. Well, and of course, there's huge capacity, sequencing capacity in yeah. China. Yeah, exactly. Um, where one would think that Exactly. A lot of opportunity. That's there. right. That's right. Now, I mean, I think one of the challenges or one of the hurdles has been concerns about consent. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that I think um, is actually an informatics problem that can be solved. Uh -huh. or at least that's what I'm told. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we open things up to uh, others who may have questions as well? Are there any other questions uh, from the group? Well, if not, uh, we have a reception outside, and uh, uh, you can direct your questions to Dr. Janeway uh, at, the, at the reception. So anyway, thank you again very much for being here.